Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks to Vance and his team for the invitation to come here for this very nice meeting. Uh, thanks to Dayan for that very wonderful overview of functional electrical stimulation. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to be focusing a bit more specifically on FES cycling, which is the core topic of this two-day meeting. I'll be focusing on issues of efficiency and performance of FES cycling. Um, and of course, there are many health-related issues, health benefits of doing this exercise, cardiorespiratory fitness, bone integrity, skin condition, and so on, that I'll not be touching on at all, so that's a separate topic. I'll be focusing on the technology of FES cycling, and in particular looking at ways that we can improve the performance. Um, and the backdrop uh, to my presentation will be the FES bike race, which took place in the Cybathlon 2016 in Zurich. Um, many people in this, this room were present at that event, and I think there were several teams in that event who are represented here today, and I think we learned a lot from the results of that particular competition. If anyone is not familiar with the Cybathlon, it's, it's a sort of Olympics for rehabilitation technology. There is a second event coming up in 2020, in May of 2020, you can see here, get ready for Zurich 2020. And the Cybathlon has six different disciplines or competitions, you can see them here. There's a BCI, a brain computer interface competition, arm prosthesis, leg prosthesis, exoskeleton, powered wheelchair, and of interest to us here, the sixth discipline was the FES bike race. So, highly competitive environment. It was an excellent opportunity for all the teams to try and optimize their technology to get the best performance. And as I say, I think we learned a lot from that. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the first part of this talk. How uh, did I get to run this video? Yeah. If anyone is not familiar with FES cycling, this little movie shows you how it works. You can see an individual here on a recumbent tricycle with a normal innervation from the brain and the spinal cord to the large muscles that move the legs. Following a spinal cord injury, we have to use an external system here. You can see an electronic stimulator at the back here, connected by wires to electrodes, in this case surface electrodes positioned over the quadriceps muscles. The control of this system is very straightforward. You need a measurement of the position of the cranks and you use this measurement to switch on and off the different muscles you're stimulating at the right time to produce a positive torque. Now this is one uh, embodiment of that schematic I showed you. This is the system that we used uh, with our team um, at the at the Cybathon 2020. It's a recumbent tricycle I'd like to uh, give uh, recognition here to the pilot for our team, that was Julien Geoffroy, who is sitting at the back this morning. Nice to see you again, Julien. Um, the bike itself, you can see here the stimulator at the back. Um, you cannot see the electrode configuration because he's wearing a cycling shorts there, but I'll show you what exactly we stimulated in a moment. Other aspects here in relation to the bike technology are that uh, the, the pilot is using customized, uh, very low weight ankle foot orthoses. So we had carbon fiber orthoses specially fitted to the pilot, very lightweight, to keep the legs very stable in the sagittal plane to stabilize everything. There were several elements of bike training that we, we did here. If you look carefully here, the crank is not round, we use an oval shaped crank which we found highly beneficial to overcome the dead points and the pilot is using a, a throttle here so that he can, on his own, he can increase or decrease the intensity of stimulation and in his other hand, in his right hand, which you can't see here, he has an electric switch to change the gear. So changing the gear to get a good cadence going is also very important. Um, I'd like to show you a video of what this, this looks like. The, the, the video I will show you is the final, the B, the so-called B final of the FES bike race. So this race was structured such that two pilots were racing against each other at any one time. There was a qualifying round. Uh, Julien was third. 
in the qualifying round, third fastest. So he got in the B final, which was the competition for the bronze medal for third and fourth place. So if we look at this, you can see the pilots ready to go. There's a, a ramp here to give them a bit of momentum to begin with. Julien Truffoy, our team is IRPT. Uh, he's ready to go there. And we were racing here against Team Hazemed from Germany, which was led by Thomas Schauer. He'll be talking later on today. It was quite interesting to come up against my former PhD student in this com uh, competitive environment, someone I taught how to do FES cycling. So you can see that the, the, the movement here is very natural looking movement. Um, Julien is using the throttle here to control the intensity, his other hand to control the gear. And we are using three channels of stimulation on each leg. And actually we are using three channels on each of the quadriceps muscles. We only stimulated quadriceps and I'll come back to that in a moment and explain why. This gives you an idea how, of how fast people can go. You can see for the the, um, the monitor here, it's a moderate running pace, I would say. Very, very, very nice um, cycling motion. He's relaxed, he's got enough time to wave to his family in the crowd. He's going very well, and in fact, you can see the clock ticking down here. It started at eight minutes. There was a time limit for this race. There were 10 half laps, a total of 750 meters and you had to complete it within eight minutes. And Julian did it in about four minutes uh, in, this, in this race. And the, the, the performance you're looking at here was actually the fastest performance of any cyclist in this competition using surface electrodes. The eventual winner used implanted electrodes. The silver medalist, who I, I think is actually coming to this meeting, um, the silver medalist was using surface electrodes. He was actually slightly slower in his silver medal performance than Julian was in his bronze medal performance here, just due to the configuration of the competition. Uh, the, the cyclist from Germany, he also did very well during this, uh, this race. He completed the course in under eight minutes. He was somewhat slower than Julian, but um, he gave a very consistent performance and, and uh, did the, the, the thing very well. So this is the configuration of the electrodes that we used in our pilot. You can see the quadriceps muscle group and the three channels of stimulation were the lateral muscles, the medial muscle, and the rectus femoris here. So AA is one channel, BB is a second channel, and C is a third channel of stimulation. Now we came up with this configuration based on a lot of training, preparatory testing, manually moving electrodes around, trying other muscle groups like the hamstrings, the gluteal muscles, the shank muscles, and we found for this particular pilot that this was the optimal configuration. Stimulating other muscle groups um, actually impeded the performance to some degree due to antagonistic muscle activation. So this was based on um, trial and error really over a long period, but I will come back later on in this talk to some scientific studies we did which looked at multi-electrode configurations and give you some data that shows that this is actually a very uh, effective way to do a stimulation. You can see the angle ranges here, we're measuring the crank angle over which these three muscle groups were switched on and off during the cycling. So these are the active ranges here from 85 degrees to something just over 200 degrees of, of extension of the leg. So the muscle groups are simply switched on and off according to this pattern here. Now I think we can learn quite a lot by looking at the performance figures for all of the subjects, for all of the pilots who completed the 10 laps in the qualifying and in the final races. I've collected here the results of 12 individual performances. Um, these are all performances where the, the 10 laps were 750 meters were completed. 12 races, and the time that the person took is on the, the y-axis. And the colour coding here shows you, for example, 1 and 2 is the same colour, that's the same pilot, the one who won it, while well, his qualifying race was number 1, his final race was slightly slower, number 2. Our pilot, Julien, as I said, was, was slightly slower. The green here is, is his qualifying round, a bit slower than his final round. So you can see his final round was a bit faster 
and the two performances of the silver medal winner here, this was four and five, was um, Team Merkel by UK, when they won the silver medal. <clears throat> so, if we look here, this performance here, the winner used an implanted stimulation system. All of the other times here were using surface electrodes. So if we look at that, we can immediately say it appears that implanted stimulation technology gives you a performance benefit by doing FES cycling. That appears to be the case, and I think talking amongst ourselves, the teams at the event, we were sort of expecting the implanted team to, to win, actually, and they did so. They had a very fast performance, very consistent here. So what implantation seems to do something very positive for the performance. However, we have to look at one other element here. You can see the winner, Team Cleveland, won two uh, implanted stimulation. The pilot had a lesion level of T4, a completeness of uh, AIS-B. Our pilot, IRPT, had a lesion level substantially higher, C8, with a B category. And also, the silver medal winner here was a C5 level. So we actually may surmise here that the lesion level could have had something to do with the difference in performance. The, the winner of the T4 level here has intact sympathetic innervation of the heart and the lungs. Sympathetic innervation of the heart and the lungs is primarily from levels T1 to T5, and you need this innervation to increase heart rate, increase breathing rate, oxygen uptake, blood supply to the muscles, in response to exercise. It's likely, therefore, that C5 and C8 injuries have some degree of impairment of sympathetic innervation of the heart and the lungs. Typically, this will lead to a blunted heart rate response and um, reduced ability to breathe faster. So, what we can say, I think, that, that was the, the these are the, the races which won the medals, the gold medal performance here, the bronze medal performance, this is the one you saw in the video, and the silver medal performance from Team uh, Berkeley Bike UK. Let's make some, some uh, conclusions from the, the FES bike race at the Cybathlon. It does appear that implanted stimulation technology may confer performance benefits. However, there is a question here. Did the injury level play a role? The winner of the competition was implanted at a lesion level of T4. The second and third performances were surface technology but a much higher level lesion. So we don't really have enough data here to conclude what's going on. My feeling is that the implantation does provide the edge here, but um, just bear that in mind, the lesion is important. If we're using surface stimulation, our experience was that determining the motor points clearly, placing the electrodes accordingly is very important. And also the multiple electrode configuration brings a lot of benefits to your performance. And finally, tuning of the bike, things like orthoses, the crank, size and configuration, electric gear shifting, all these things are very important for tweaking the performance and getting the, 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 the most you can out of that. So we learned a lot from that experience and I'm sure we'll learn, learn a lot from the FAS bike race in just over two years from now in, in Zurich. Okay, let me move to some um, more scientific level studies that we've done relating to the efficiency and performance of FES cycling. Let's look at the efficiency of cycling. What is efficiency? Well, in any energy transformation process, the efficiency is the energy output divided by the energy input, or equivalently, the average power in divided by the average power coming out divided by the energy going in. And in the context of FES cycling, the energy coming out, the power output is a mechanical output that the stimulated muscles are doing on the cranks. That's relatively easy to measure mechanically. And the power going in is the metabolic power that we can measure by measuring the oxygen uptake on a breath-by-breath -breath basis. So the, the amount of oxygen that's being utilized under steady state conditions reflects the energy that's being used because we know that one liter of oxygen consumed in the muscles is, uh, corresponds roughly to 20 kilojoules of energy. 
So if we have a steady state measurement of oxygen uptake, we can use the energy equivalent of the oxygen being used to cal calculate the metabolic energy going into the system. So this is the setup we use for measuring efficiency. Breath by breath measurement. We also have additional instrumentation on the trike here and an electric motor to control the cadence to a very precise level of, of speed. What's going on here is that the oxygen is being taken up at the lungs, it's being transported by the blood to the working muscles, it's being consumed there, and as a byproduct, CO2 is produced in the muscles, it's transported back to the lungs, and we have CO2 output at the level of the lungs. So, in steady state conditions, when we're doing steady state aerobic exercise, the oxygen uptake at the lungs is equal to the oxygen rate of oxygen consumption in the muscles. And this is why we can use steady state aerobic measurements to estimate the energy equivalent. This is an example calculation that shows a measurement of the efficiency of cycling in a spinal cord injured participant with a motor and sensory complete lesion, AISA. You can see at the top here the power output measured at the legs. This is passive, so here, at this level here, the motor is turning the legs, there's no stimulation. Stimulation is then initiated. There was a very small increase in power output here. You can see the difference here in power between passive and stimulated cycling is about 5 watts. Very, very tiny power output. This is an untrained uh, participant in this case. And while that's going on, we measure the oxygen uptake. Here is the passive oxygen uptake, and you can see a delta, you can see an increase in oxygen uptake during the stimulated steady state part of the work here. So in the efficiency calculation, the 5 watts, 5.27 watts mechanical power output appears here in the numerator, and the oxygen uptake level during active stimulated cycling is this 0.486, and during passive it's 0.316, and both of these are multiplied by the energy equivalent of roughly 20 kilojoules. If we do this equation, we see that the efficiency of cycling is 8%. Now this is very, very small in comparison to able-bodied people doing normal cycling, who have an efficiency in the range of 25-30%. to 30%. So FES cycling is very inefficient, very inefficient. That was one um, example calculation from one specific participant. We did a study in 10, first of all, in 10 untrained subjects, and we found indeed the total work efficiency was about 8%, and the oxygen cost of the work, the number of milliliters per minute of oxygen uptake per watt of output was about 40 milliliters per minute per watt. And for an able-bodied person cycling, the value you would get there would be about 10 or 12. So you require much less oxygen to do the same amount of work in an able body case. So efficiency is about one third or one quarter of normal. The oxygen cost is about three or four times higher. So these two are the, the, the inverse of each other. FS cycling is very inefficient. What happens if the participants are trained intensively? We did a study where um, about 10 participants were trained, or trained themselves at home, for one year, doing five cycling sessions per week, each of one hour. So it's a highly intensive training study that we did. We looked at many of the health outcomes, which I'll not say much about, but we also measured work efficiency at baseline after six months of training and after 12 months. And you can see here, uh, efficiency does not improve with training. Similarly, the oxygen cost does not decrease with training. So although the total peak power output dramatically increased, it's also the case that the peak oxygen uptake capacity increased, and these two things increased in the same relative proportion, therefore the efficiency stayed more or less the same. So there's something else about inefficiency that, uh, that, are that is causing the, the problem, it's not the lack of training itself. Let's look into a bit more detail of what that reason might actually be. We did a study of volitional FES, uh, sorry, volitional cycling 
versus FAS cycling in a group of able-bodied subjects. So these uh, participants were able-bodied, they were able to cycle on their own, and then we did some measurements while they were trying to be passive and we were stimulating them, so it was stimulation of able-bodied persons, and we measured the efficiency. Here you see the results in able-bodied participants, 11 subjects. For volitional cycling, the efficiency was in the, in the normal range of about 30%. If they are passive and we use stimulation only, the efficiency immediately drops to half of the, of the, of the normal value. So this is interesting, it's half the normal value, but it's still much higher than the efficiency we saw in spinal cord injured subjects. Let's have a look at some of the reasons for the low efficiency in this group of able-bodied. Unfavorable biomechanics, clearly we're very crudely recruiting the muscles and we are stimulating them at very crudely calculated parts of the, of the, of the cycle. When able-bodied people cycle volitionally, there's a very fine-tuned control of many, many different muscle groups in the legs. Secondly, there's the typical uh, reason in FES of non-physiological recruitment of muscle fibers. Different recruitment uh, uh, sequences of muscles of different fiber types. Uh, and also the deterministic, the synchronous stimulation of muscle groups is not physiological. These are probably the reasons why efficiency drops to half when we switch from volitional to FES cycling. Let's look at a bit, in a bit more detail at some of the data from the literature that we can use to compare these things. Here I've listed some of the studies. The ones you can see in this column are our studies, normal volitional cycling, 30%. The same participants being stimulated, 16%. And trained and untrained uh, cycling for spinal cord injured subjects drops to about 8%. These values are very similar to historical efficiency values we see from a Glazer for normal subjects in the range of 25 to 30%. For spinal cord injured participants with FES, they measure about 10%. And now I'd like to focus on a very interesting study here, which was by Kier, a group in, in Denmark. Quite an old study, this one, I think it was the beginning of the 90s. And what they did here, they took a group of able-bodied subjects measured their efficiency during volitional cycling, it was in the normal range, and then they did a lumbar anesthesia on these able-bodied participants, paralyzed them effectively, and then measured their efficiency during FES cycling. A very interesting experiment. I'm not sure that these days you would get the ethical approval for that sort of thing. But interestingly, in this able-bodied anesthetized group of subjects, the efficiency drops right into the spinal cord range. So let's look at the differences between all these different groups. If we compare normal subjects cycling with FES against spinal cord, uh, the spinal cord people have lack of sensory feedback and vasomotor control, muscle atrophy, fiber type conversion, uh, reduced blood supply, and the, spinal, and the normal people may have also had some volitional, unconscious volitional input, which increased that. Now is the interesting part, if we compare the normal cyclists with the able-bodied cyclists who are anesthetized, the only difference here is the lack of sensory feedback and vasomotor control. The able-bodied subjects who had an anesthesia did not have atrophy, fiber type conversion or problems with the blood supply because they were acutely um, anesthetized. So it would appear that this lack of sensory feedback and vasomotor control is a key element in paralyzed subjects, be it able-bodied anesthetized or spinal cord, that has a major impact on the efficiency. And what we mean by lack of sensory feedback and vasomotor control is when we are exercising, normally the blood supply is focused on the working muscles and restricted to the organs and the muscles that are not working to do the exercise. This level of vasomotor control is absent in the spinal cord injury, so this appears to be something that is, is critical. And there's not much we can do about that. So to conclude on FES cycling, in able-bodied cyclists efficiency is about half, spinal cord and anesthetized efficiency is about one third of normal. It doesn't change in response to, to training. 
and there are some biological and biomechanical reasons why that is the case. The final question we want to answer here is, is efficiency important anyway? So we all talk about low efficiency in cycling using FES, is that important? The answer is it might be or it might not be, it depends on your therapeutic or functional goals. Clearly, if we're interested in mobile cycling performance, increasing efficiency is important. What we want to do there is for a given level of metabolic cost, we want to increase the, the mechanical power output. In other words, increase efficiency. If we're interested in stationary therapy for cardiopulmonary conditioning, the opposite is the case. We're not interested in mechanical power output. Everyone's sitting in a stationary therapy device, you're not going anywhere, you don't need power output. What you are trying to do is to increase the metabolic challenge or increase the metabolic cost of the work. So in contrast to mobile cycling, here for a given mechanical power output, we want to increase the metabolic cost. That means we want to decrease the efficiency. And there are other therapeutic goals in stationary FES cycling where we would even be interested in negative efficiency. If you think about maximizing bone loading to, to do bone therapy, the highest forces are created when we are doing eccentric muscle stimulation. So effectively stimulating the muscles at the wrong time. You cannot cycle, the muscles are restricting the motion. There's a negative mechanical power output and a negative efficiency. So let's summarize here and say efficiency is low in FES cycling, but depending on your goal, this may or may not be the issue. So therefore, I'm focusing from here on, on performance of cycling. We want to maximize power output for mobile cycling, and we want to maximize fatigue resistance. So we want endurance and power output, and this is where I'm, I'm going uh, now in the re remainder of, of this talk. Yeah, we're doing okay. The first thing I'll talk about is electrode configurations, and you saw in my um, discussion of, of our pilot in the Simathon, we were using a multi-electrode configuration. Um, I'm, I have a sequence of, of slides here showing some scientific results, which, which pins this down a bit more uh, quantitatively. We've done some studies on a, a, a type of stimulation known as spatially distributed sequential stimulation, or SDSS. Schematically, these are the original publications which looked at um, isometric application of this technique. So what you do in SDSS is that you take one of the electrodes, the active electrode, and you split it into a number of smaller individual electrodes. In this case, you can see an example of single electrode stimulation on the left. This electrode has the, the same total surface area as the four small ele electrodes, but each of the small electrodes is stimulated with one quarter of the frequency uh, of the single electrode stimulation. So here you see a certain frequency of stimulation. Here you see that each small electrode in the SDSS configuration has one quarter of the frequency. So the total stimulation is the same, the surface area of the stimulation is the same, and the total frequency across all four electrodes is the same. This is one uh, particular embodiment of SDSS against SES that we used in our studies. We used a configuration where we had SDSS and SES uh, laterally and medially over the quadriceps muscle group um, using four individual electrodes for SDSS where again the surface area was the same uh, as for the single electrode stimulation. And you see the Stimulation pulse is going to the SDSS, small electrodes, and to the single electrode configuration on the right. So again, four electrodes, we're using one quarter of the frequency on the left-hand side. This is the, the embodiment of that. You can see the experimental setup with the subject sitting on a dynamometer. This slide is intended to show you that placement of the electrodes is very important, and in particular, Targeting the motor points is very important. Here you can see, uh, let's see this is an able-bodied person searching for his motor point here with an electrode pen. 
you can see a very, very strong reaction at one particular point. So I, I strongly recommend anyone involved in this sort of technology to use this kind of searching for motor points and position the electrodes accordingly. Motor points tend to be very individual from person to person. It won't help you very much to look at anatomy books. If you look at anatomy books, you will see motor points depicted. But individuals are very, very different. There can be quite a, a variation. And also in a, in a particular individual, those points tend to vary quite a bit from day to day. So it's worth always looking for the motor points uh, on a day to day basis if you really want to maximize performance. I'll show you some uh, results now from the study we did. This is the experimental situation. It was a knee dynamometer, and we were using the dynamometer to extend and flex the knee joint at a velocity which is more or less the same as the angular velocity that we use during FES cycling at a normal cadence. So it more or less simulates cycling. You can see the STSS on the left and the SES on the right hand side. This is um, a, a, an average of the power output, the mean power output over a roughly 200 knee extensions. This is the development over time of the average power output. The orange line is SDSS <coughs> and the blue line is SES. This is eight able-bodied participants initially. I'll show you able-bodied results here. You can see here that there is a clear increase in the mean power output using the SDSS configuration. Numerically, you can see the values here. We see SES in this column, SDSS, the multi-electrode configuration here, uh, the mean difference in confidence intervals of the p-values for the comparisons between SES and SDSS. And the, three, the four outcomes you can see here are the power, initial power during the initial phase of the exercise, the final power, and the overall power, mean power over the whole exercise. And we can also see a fatigue index at the bottom here. The fatigue index you should interpret as follows. One means no fatigue and zero means completely fatigued. So if we compare the values here you can see in all cases here the power output initial, final and overall is substantially higher with SDSS. The p-values are very very low so statistically and practically significant results and also the fatigue is less with SDSS significantly less. There's a, um, a moderate level of evidence here with the p-value that fatigue is less with SDSS. So that's very encouraging. It reflects what we saw in practice in the, in the cybertron. Here are some, I think, even more important results. This is a study we recently completed with four spinal cord injured participants. They were all AISA, motor and sensory complete. So this is a case series uh, of four participants, one, two, three, and four. The mean overall power output for SDSS is shown in orange for each participant and for SES in blue. And you can see very clearly here there is a consistent and very large increase in power output using the multiple electrode configuration. Consistent is the same for all subjects and large. These are people who had not previously trained, by the way. This is a summary of the, of the results averaged across the four subjects. Uh, SDSS, power output over all of the extensions, and SES, it's higher here. And the overall power, comparing SES and SDSS, much higher overall. Higher initial power, higher final power, and the fatigue is slightly less with the SDSS. And just to bear in mind, the total amount of stimulation we're supplying is exactly the same for both configurations. So there's something fundamental going on here. Those were the four participants. We did a measurement here with our Cybathlon pilot. He was not part of the scientific study, but he was available to make the measurement on the dynamometer. And for this trained uh, participant, this trained FES cyclist, the results with SDSS were even more dramatically higher than with the single electrode configuration. And this is more or less the electrode configuration, well, it was multi-electrode that was employed uh, with Julien during the Cybathlon race. So, to summarize here the, the, this part of the talk, 
the spatially distributed sequential stimulation, the multiple electrode configuration gave much higher power output compared to a conventional single electrode stimulation by a factor of more than one and a half. It was actually 2.3 in the cyclotron pilot. In all participants that we studied in our, in our projects, spinal cord and able-bodied, for all phases of the exercise, initial, final and overall, and SDSS also had a, had a very much improved fatigue resistance. So there is very strong evidence here that multiple electrode configurations really do, to a very significant degree, improve performance with FES cycling. Now I'd like to fairly quickly, at this point, talk about another method of trying to improve performance using this time the stimulation parameters. We've talked about electrode configurations. We've looked at some studies where we randomly modulated the stimulation parameters themselves, the stimulation patterns. The parameters that we have available during stimulation for any FAS application, there are three main parameters. One is the period, or the interpulse interval, or equivalent of the frequency of stimulation. Second parameter is the amplitude, and the third parameter is the pulse width. These are the three parameters that we can play with to try and uh, see what happens and try and see if it has any uh, effect on efficiency and performance. The first study we did was looking at random modulation of the interpulse interval. So randomly modulating the, the frequency of stimulation. In all of these studies I'll show you we did comparative studies of two patterns, P1 and P2. P1 is al always a conventional constant frequency, constant amplitude, constant pulse width pattern, like here. P2 is the random pulse pattern, and in this case you can see the frequency is randomized here. Um, the, the interpulse interval is changing all the time on a random basis. We structured this so that the total amount of stimulation in both cases was the same. The other thing we looked at was stochastically or randomly modulating the amplitude of each pulse and also the, the pulse width of each pulse. So the comparison here was between P1 and P2. P1 is the conventional constant frequency constant amplitude, constant pulse width scenario. And P2, you can see here the amplitude and the pulse width um, is, is randomly modulated. For the P2 here, we kept the frequency the same. So it's a combined stochastic modulation of amplitude and pulse width. I'll go through these results fairly quickly. I'm, I'm aware I have quite a lot of data here. We tested these concepts using two types of exercise. One was knee dynamometry and the other one was using an FES cycle. Very quickly, for the knee dynamometer, this is able-bodied participants, P1 and P2, so this is the random modulation of the interpulse interval. P1 is normal stimulation, P2 is stochastic modulation of the frequency. You can see here, stochastic modulation gives a little bit of increase, well actually quite a lot of increase, in the power output during the first 30 uh, extensions, the final 30 extensions, and overall, and the p-values are, are, are quite uh, significant in that case. There appears to be no difference in the fatigability. So initial evidence in the knee dynamometer with able-bodied is that random modulation frequency gives higher power output. However, looking at the FES bike type of exercise, the results are, are slightly contradictory. There's no difference in final and uh, first and last, uh, initial and final power. P values are not significant. And in actual fact, using random modulation of frequency, the overall power output is slightly lower than normal stimulation. The p value is not quite as strong there, but it is uh, below the significance threshold, and there's no difference in frequency. So we have a slight contradiction here in relation to random modulation of the frequency. Let's look at the combined modulation of amplitude and pulse width. Again, looking at the knee dynamometer first. Here you can see not much difference. There is a slight amount of evidence 
of higher power output during the final phase with random modulation and there is also slightly better fatigue property here the fatigue index is slightly different this is the percentage loss between initial and final power so there's a slightly less a lower rate of fatigue is significant using stochastic modulation so a little bit of evidence that pulse width and amplitude modulation brings a little bit of more extra power and a little bit less fatigue the final result was using the FES bike with amplitude and pulse width modulation here you can see there is a little bit of evidence there's a um, just slightly non-significant uh, in terms of the final power and the overall power but again the fatigue is, is slightly better using stochastic modulation so if I can conclude these results, this part of the talk here using random modulation of the frequency, higher power output than the e-dynamometer a bit of evidence of lower power output on the FES bike so there's a slight conflict of results there fatigue properties are similar looking at the combined modulation of amplitude and pulse width there is a little bit of evidence of higher power and significantly better fatigue properties so if we look overall the results here are not as strong, not as convincing as multi-electrode configurations but I believe the evidence here is strong enough that we should investigate this further with spinal cord injured participants I don't have the data with uh, paralyzed subjects so I recommend that we continue to look at that. Okay. This brings me to the, 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 the end of my talk. I'd like to make a few general conclusions here. And I mean, through the different parts of my talk, I've given you the, the conclusions for the different parts of the talk. What I'd like to do here is actually, rather than give conclusions, is give some recommendations based on our experience, both from the Cybathon and from the scientific studies on what you should do if you're engaged in FES cycling as a, as a team member or as a pilot to improve your performance, what have we learned so far? The first thing I would definitely recommend to everyone is to register for the bike race at the next Cybathlon. This is a highly competitive environment. It will give you strong motivation to improve your performance. That's the first thing. So if you haven't registered yet, I think you should do so. And by the way, the, the FES bike race 2020 has um, 16 slots for teams. At the previous one it was only 12, and uh, the people at AT had tell me that so far 8 teams have registered. Who's registered? So we've got quite a few teams. Okay, we've got 5 or 6 of those 8 are in this room. So listen carefully to my recommendations. First recommendation, if you can, use an implanted stimulator. It's not really available to many people, but if you can, you can do it. There was a talk last week at the IFS conference in Nottville on implanted stimulation technology, which shows that actually implantation is becoming better and better, more practical, more available. Um, it does appear that you can get better performance. If you can't, if you're like me, you have to use uh, surface electrodes, I strongly recommend going for multiple electrode configurations on the different muscle groups that you are, are targeting. At some point you will run into a limitation on the number of channels of your stimulator, but get as many channels going as you can and stimulate each muscle group with multiple electrodes of different configurations. The one I showed you was one simple way to do it. There's SDSS, there are electrode arrays, just use what you can and experiment and see what you can get. But the evidence, empirical evidence and scientific evidence is very strong. Targeting the motor points, I very much think that is, it tends to be neglected, but um, has been shown in our experience to be very important and try to do that on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Modulation of stimulation parameters, you may want to try that, but I have a question mark over that at the moment because the evidence is not quite as strong as it should be. But try it, you never know, you might get somewhere with that. Those are my recommendations in terms of stimulation. I also highly recommend looking very carefully at your bike hardware 
and do as much tuning there as you can. The ankle orthoses are very important. I, I noted in the cyclothlon that many people were using very heavy, very clunky, big um, ankle orthoses. We used to do that as well, and we found immediately we went to an orthotics company, they took a cast of Julien's legs, made this very lightweight orthosis. The performance improvement was quite dramatic just by customizing the orthoses. We had very good experience with the oval crank. Um, again, empirical, trying it, we saw an improvement there. It helps you to get over the dead points. Optimizing the gear shifting, I think, is very important. Um, the issue there is that the pilot is able to have his cadence in an optimal range. We, we find that roughly 50 RPM of the legs going round is quite a good optimal cadence. And obviously, the gear you select depends on the speed you're going at. So it's important that the, the pilot trains, and Julian trained very much outside during his training sessions to, to play with learning how the gears work and feeling for himself, it's really a motor learning task, what is the best cadence for him to use. Um, I, I think, just to reflect back on, on our pilot's performance in the cyclothlon, the, the qualifying race we were a bit slower. We think that's because he didn't quite get the gear shifting right, he wasn't working at a good range, but in the final he got everything absolutely perfect. His cadence was perfect, his gear shifting was optimal. Um, you can do that electrically, manually, as Julien did, or you can automate it. We also have a system in there that automates the gear shifting <coughs> based on cadence and speed. There are many other things you could look at. I've focused here on the primary factors I believe are important. So with that, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging a number of people. The first one is, is Julien himself. He's just here, pictured after the bronze medal. Um, ceremony. The two PhD students that were working with me, Marco Laubacher and Anil Axos, actually did all of the work in relation to setting up the bike, helping Julian with the training and getting the thing working. Um, they were both funded on a project uh, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation over a period of uh, four years and we acknowledge that funding. And actually both of these guys are today submitting their PhD theses uh, at the 8th they had Zurich and they have their Viva on the 25th of September, so we wish them well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.